Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension and on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night 50 times a year. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you Steve Carpenter. He's a professor in the Center for Limnology and the Department of Zoology. He was born in Kansas City, Missouri, on the Missouri side. He uh, went to high school in Bethesda, Maryland, where he went to Walter Johnson High School. And as he pointed out to me, that's probably the only high school that he knows of that's named for a major league pitcher. He got his undergraduate degree at Amherst College and then came here for his master's and PhD in botany here at UW-Madison. Then he spent 10 years at that university called Notre Dame du Lac, otherwise known to most of us as Notre Dame. But since he's a limnologist, you gotta throw in there that du Lac. In 1989, he came back to UW-Madison where he's been ever since. Tonight he's gonna to be talking with us about early warnings of big changes in complex systems. Please join me in welcoming Steve Carpenter to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Well, thanks everyone for uh, coming out on, uh, on a night that looks stormy, and thank you, Tom, for that nice introduction. Um, I welcome the chance to talk with you today about some research that I've been involved in for about the uh, past 15 years about uh, very large changes in ecosystems. An ecosystem is a place on Earth and all the animals and plants that live there along with their abi abiotic environment. And as you'll see in a minute, sometimes those change in a very big way fairly quickly and we've been trying to uh, figure out how that works and if there are ever warnings of it. So let's start with a familiar example. In 2011, Lake Erie experienced the largest bloom of toxic algae in history. The limnologists who were studying Lake Erie said, you know, this is a harbinger of things to come. And they were right. In 2014, an even larger algae bloom, uh, again of toxic cyanobacteria, more about those in a, in a few minutes, uh, emerged on Lake Erie and shut down the water supply for 300,000 people. Uh, it made uh, national and international news. The uh, Toledo Blade did a terrific job of covering it, and if you go to their website, you see uh, uh, a lot of articles uh, about it. It was a major environmental problem and ultimately a very expensive one for the city of, of Toledo. So that's an example of a big change in an ecosystem, in this case, the ecosystem being Lake Erie. Lakes uh, do this all the time, and in southern Wisconsin, we see big algae blooms um, uh, frequently. They uh, usually occur in July, August, maybe early September, so we'll start to see them in the news uh, any day now. Lakes can also be in a very clear uh, state where you could uh, lower a dinner plate into the water a long, long way and, uh, and still see it. An example of uh, big alternative configurations of that ecosystem. Coral reefs are another example that's been in the news uh, recently. Uh, uh, we think of coral reefs as this tourist attraction with beautiful fish and ornate corals, but uh, they uh, can suffer massive mortality events. Sometimes those are due to nutrient inputs, sometimes those are due uh, to invading species, and sometimes those are due to warm water. Uh, just in the last month, Month, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia has suffered the largest bleaching event in history and a massive amount of corals in Australia uh, have died, particularly in the northern part of the reef, which is uh, the northern uh, uh, stretch of it. And the scientists there think we're looking at uh, decades to hundreds of years for recovery of that major tourist attraction for Australia. 
And they're also known from rangelands very well. Rangelands uh, uh, have two configurations. One is fairly grassy, shown at the top, and that's a really good situation if you're trying to raise sheep or cattle. They can also be covered with shrubs, as in the picture at the bottom, and that's a really bad setup if you're trying to raise uh, sheep and, and cattle, because sheep and cattle don't get much uh, out of that uh, forage. Goats maybe would, but but not uh, uh, sheep and cattle. What goes on is uh, if you overgraze the rangeland in a dry year, you eliminate the grass and it can no longer carry fire. And fire is needed to kill off the shrubs and keep them from getting a toehold. So overgrazing uh, combined with a drought, uh, even a short drought, can switch the ecosystem from grassy to shrubby, and its economic value is down the drain. The only way to reverse it at that point is with a D9 caterpillar, and that can be costly. Scientists have developed many mathematical models for uh, how these sorts of large changes in ecosystems occur. And of course, the details of those models are intricate and uh, uh, highly dependent on the ecosystem that, uh, that, that is under study. But they all have uh, uh, some common features. And I'm just going to show you some of the common features uh, uh, right now. Um, the, uh, we think about the state of the system. So for example, is the water turbid or clear? Or is the grassland grassy or shrubby? Or is the coral reef in good shape? Or has it died off? We think about driving conditions, uh, such as the nutrient input to a lake, or the grazing intensity on the grassland, or uh, whether there are lots of algae overgrowing uh, the coral. And uh, uh, in the models, you can calculate something called a potential surface. And I'm not going to go into how you do the calculation, but I've shown five examples of them here in gray. So in this upper potential surface, we've really only got one valley. And the ecosystem represented by the ball is sitting in that one valley. And as we move to this second potential uh, surface, changing the conditions down on this axis here, now all of a sudden we have two valleys. And the ecosystem can be in either one. Um, we call that a critical transition because uh, a different uh, set of stable points has appeared. So we now have two stable points where we uh, used to have one. Um, and uh, the ecosystem, as it turns out, will spend most of its time in the deepest of the, uh, uh, of, of the valleys. Then in the, uh, I'm having a little trouble, there we go waking up my pointer here, it's sleeping. In, uh, uh, in the third one, now uh, the new valley has deepened, actually. So the ecosystem will spend even more time over there. In the fourth frame, it's deepened even more. And actually, the situation in the original valley is getting quite precarious. And in this last panel, the original valley has completely disappeared, and the ecosystem has moved over here. So if this is, say, the shrubby state, and we started in the grassy state, or if this is the turbid lake and we started in the clear lake, we've now undergone a very massive change in the ecosystem. And this general pattern of changing valleys and the ecosystem moving from valley to valley in a potential surface occurs in all the models of uh, this type of process. Um, another imp uh, important word that I'm going to use again and again is resilience. Resilience is a measure of how deep the valley is. So a very deep valley is a resilient one. The ecosystem is not going to leave there very easily. A low resilience valley is a very shallow one where a little push could knock the ecosystem out of the valley. Uh, I'm hovering now over a very low resilience ecosystem. So uh, uh, if we want to predict 
one of these changes, the key lies in figuring out a way to measure the resilience of the valley where the ecosystem sits and determine if that valley is losing its resilience. So I'm gonna talk about measuring resilience in uh, the slides to come. Are you, are you all with me? Okay. Um, this is, uh, I've, on, I've only got a couple of really technical diagrams. This is a very important one. Okay, so the question we started to ask in the early 2000s is, are there generic indicators of declining resilience? Um, ecosystem managers all over the world uh, worry about these alternate states that ecosystems can be in because up until about 15 years ago, we thought there were no good ways of predicting the transition between states. So they generally came as surprises and often they were very expensive surprises. Um, we're now beginning to get a clue that, uh, that, that there are various ways of predicting these, tradition, these transitions. Um, by uh, I'm not gonna talk very much about specific indicators, but uh, uh, I, I, I think those are uh, fairly straightforward to understand. The idea is to monitor the drivers and conditions that lead to big changes and uh, point out that the ecosystem is at risk. For example, I don't really need a very sophisticated indicator of algae blooms in Lake Mendota because there are 40,000 cows out there and those cows have been dumping manure on the ground and in the streams all winter long. And I'm pretty sure that as soon as we get some big thunderstorms, that manure is going into Lake Mendota and it's gonna turn green. That's a very specific indicator. I can't generalize that to a rangeland or a coral reef, and maybe I can't even generalize it to another lake. But uh, I've, I've kind of got Lake Mendota nailed because I know what's causing uh, that, that green water out there. By a generic indicator, I mean a statistical pattern that emerges before big changes in many kinds of complex systems. So if you uh, understood a generic indicator, you could go to a rangeland, a coral reef, a forest, a lake, uh, an ocean, and you could uh, estimate its resilience. So I'm asking, are there generic things that, uh, that, that we could measure? Um, I got started on this, this work with the folks at the bottom of uh, the slide. Martin Sheffer is one of the world's most famous theoretical ecologists, and he is uh, deservedly famous for the terrific work he's done on alternate states in a wide range of ecosystems over uh, about 30 years. Buzz Brock is a mathematical economist here at UW-Madison. He's one of the top nonlinear econometricians in uh, the world. And uh, he got interested in this pro uh, problem and, and uh, was a key member of, of the group. Egbert Van Ness is a physicist in Holland. Vasilis Dakos is a theoretical ecologist from Greece who now lives in uh, Switzerland. And the, uh, the group of us have worked off and on, uh, usually meeting in a nice place for a few days on, uh, on, on this problem. Uh, since the early 2000s. So to, to, kind of, to focus our thinking about generic indicators a little bit, let me give you another uh, example and a very dramatic example of alternate states in ecosystems. The Sahara Desert right now is a vast area of sand with the occasional camel, an oasis here and there, uh, and, uh, and, and a few uh, uh, migratory uh, people, uh, uh, Bedouins. But it's a, it's a pretty dry place. A few thousand years ago, it was a vast wetland with rivers and lakes all over it, hippopotamus, a very moist area, dramatically different from the way uh, it was uh, today. And um, what went on there? 
Um, we know a lot about the Ahara because we can measure the dust that fell into the Atlantic Ocean for thousands and thousands of years. So the uh, left-hand panel there uh, shows the outline of Africa. This is a satellite image, and you can see a billowing dust storm out here of dust blowing out from northern Africa over the Atlantic. It sinks in the ocean. Some of it sinks in the ocean. And you can go out and core the ocean and reconstruct uh, the uh, dust deposition rate for thousands of years. <coughs> and between about 9,000 and 5,700 years ago, it was a pretty low dust deposition rate. And that's one of the reasons that we knew, know we were dealing with a very wet environment in the Sahara, because if it was dry, there would be a lot of dust moving around. Now, if you were uh, uh, that, this hippopotamus sitting there, and you were a scientifically inclined hippopotamus, you might look at that data and think, uh, this ecosystem is staying wet. The, uh, uh, there's not much trend there in the dust deposition, and it, uh, if I had to predict the dust level for the next thousand years, I'd say it's going to be between 40 and 50 which is a, is a low number. So I'm feeling pretty good if I'm a hippopotamus. But here's what actually happened. Between about 5,000 and 5,700 years ago, there was a marked increase in dust deposition. And we now know from many paleoecological studies that that period of a few hundred years marked a rapid transition in the moisture regime of the, Ahara, of the Sahara region. So it moved from relatively wet to relatively dry in a fairly short period of time. The point I want to make is that simply by looking at that time series from uh, uh, 9,000 to 5,700 years ago, you wouldn't really have guessed that this was going to happen and that this would become the new normal. This is the kind of situation we'd like to have a generic indicator for. This is my second um, uh, fairly technical slide that you have to pay attention to. There are some other data slides you can ignore, but this is another one you have to pay attention to. And it has to do with the behavior of the ecosystem in its valley. Uh, uh, in cases where the valley is highly resilient or not very resilient. In the case where the valley is highly resilient, on the left, the valley is pretty deep. Um, if we perturb the ecosystem a lot, really whack it and drive it up the side of the valley, it's going to snap back pretty fast to where it was. Um, it's not going to take its time to come back. And uh, it, will, it turns out that if you expose the ball to small shocks for a long period of time, you get a very constrained variability, like I'm hovering over now. It also turns out that if you try to predict next year from this year, so you try to predict the state in year, in year t plus 1 from the state at year t, you don't get a very good prediction. All the data sort of cluster in a ball here. And they're not giving, so knowing conditions this year doesn't really help you very much in knowing conditions next year. You know you're somewhere in the ball, but that's about it. Contrast that with the situation in this low resilience ecosystem over here. So now the valley is pretty flat. And, and in fact, we know the ecosystem is pretty precarious. It, it could fairly easily be tipped over into the more resilient valley. But let's think about resilience in this low resilience valley. Now, if we perturb the ecosystem by driving it a long way up the slope, it's going to take much longer to come back its recovery time will be longer. If we look at the variability over time, we see these wide sprint, swings, and it's sort of sticky. So it swings up somewhere, gets stuck for a little while. Then it swings somewhere else, gets stuck for a while. Very different pattern over here than we saw over here in the variability. 
Um, and we can measure statistics such as the variance or the standard deviation, which I'll use later in the talk. Those are just ways of me measuring how variable uh, it, it is. We can measure that variability. Um, down here, we see that if we want to predict next year from this year, we can do pretty well, actually. We've got a pretty tight relationship between this year and next year. Uh, that's called autocorrelation. That means the system has memory or it's sticky, as I mentioned uh, a few moments ago. It, it uh, uh, doesn't uh, change very quickly. So if you know the state uh, at uh, a given time, you know quite a lot about what the state of the system will be uh, the next time. For example, if the system is right here, I know it's going to be right about there next time. So it's relatively predictable. That can be measured too. This, 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 uh, uh, th this phenomenon, the second one that I mentioned, is called autocorrelation. There's a simple statistic for measuring that. So we can measure the variability and the autocorrelation. And if those are going up, resilience is going down. You got it, right? Um, if those are going down, if autocorrelation is going down and variance is going down, resilience is going up, right? So we've got a tool now. We've got something we can measure uh, to work with uh, uh, resilience in uh, these complex systems. This looks complicated, but I'm going to give you the bottom line very quickly. These are two laboratory experiments, highly replicated, very carefully conducted laboratory experiments that test the theory that I just showed you. In the experiment on the left, cyanobacteria, uh, the uh, toxic algae that I was talking about a minute ago, um, are exposed to little shocks in the nutrient level that they receive at uh, different levels of light extinction. And as uh, these cyanobacteria are very sensitive to uh, light, so when the light intensity goes up, they do not do as well. And the experiment measured the recovery rate in a, in a, that's how long it takes to come back from a perturbation as a function of light intensity, and it went down. And here at 0.6, this point right here, they collapsed. They didn't come back at all. So this experiment shows the decrease in recovery rate that I talked about just a few minutes ago in a very carefully controlled laboratory experiment. The right-hand experiment is one with yeast. Uh, and uh, these yeast, uh, uh, in this case, actually have two uh, stable states. One is a high concentration of yeast, and the other is when they're extinct. So they're, they're gone. They're, that's a really bad alternate state that we all should try to stay out of. Um, but nonetheless, the researchers were able to measure resilience indicators as they moved along this curve. Um, and they knew a lot about the yeast, so they knew a lot about the growth. And they measured the autocorrelation, and dilution factor is the stress. So as dilution factor goes up, eventually the yeast collapse to the extinct stable state. And the autocorrelation time, which is just an um, a, a exponential transform of the autocorrelation, goes up. So autocorrelation goes up as we approach the collapse point exactly as we said it would. Resilience got low, autocorrelation goes up. And standard deviation, which is a measure of variability, standard deviation is just the square root of the, of the variance, it goes up. So this experiment also corroborates the theory. It says that as autocorrelation and variance go up, resilience goes down, even to the point of causing this yeast population to disappear. So it's just experimental evidence for the theory I gave you a minute ago. OK? OK. All right, now I'm finally back to the kinds of ecosystems I like to work on, which is big ones. 
And uh, so uh, if this theory is going to be any good, we have to be able to use it in real world ecosystems to measure resilience. And to do that, a uh, research team of uh, late collaborators uh, 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 helped me out in designing an experiment to test the theory. And some of these people are my very oldest uh, uh, friends. Um, John Cole and I were undergraduates together. We worked in the same lab when we were sophomores. Jim Kitchell uh, was uh, on, our, uh, on my PhD committee. Uh, Mike Pace uh, and Jim Hodgson are long-term friends. Mike is at University of Virginia, Hodgson at uh, um, St. Norbert College in De Pere. Jim Kitchell's retired from from UW-Madison. John Cole is retired from the uh, Ecosystem Center uh, in New York. Uh, we worked on some lakes here in northern Wisconsin. There's our uh, crew uh, there in that team picture. The basic idea was to use something called the trophic cascade as a test case. Kitchell and I discovered the trophic cascade in the early 1980s and published a number of papers about it and, and we have uh, uh, figured out how it works pretty well and we know it's a critical transition. Um, and uh, the, the two states of the lake are shown in uh, uh, the diagram here. In one case, you have a lot of large, big, voracious predatory fish. That's the bottom case. And uh, I'm trying to, there we go. So we've got a lot of these big guys. They eat or, in some cases, terrorize the little guys. And, and so they leave. The little guys normally would eat these uh, crustacean zooplankton, particularly Daphnia, those are little animals about this big that live in the lake, but if they're terrified or absent, they can't eat the Daphnia. And the Daphnia eat the algae, and when there's a lot of Daphnia, there are not very many algae. That's called a trophic cascade because it goes bang, 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 bang down the trophic levels of, of the lake. The opposite state is a state where heavy fishing pressure has driven out the big fish. So the big fish numbers are reduced to very low or maybe they're absent. In that case, you get a lot of the little fish. They quickly wipe out the Daphnia and other big zooplankton and you get lots of algae. We know this is a critical transition and we thought we could use it to test the theory in a, in a lake. The first thing we do before we do any of these experiments is we do a lot of computer modeling. And we, in the case of the Trophic Cascade, we had a really good computer model that we'd been honing for more than 20 years at the time we did the experiments. And uh, the, uh, uh, what I've shown diagrammatically here is the transition in the fish from big fish to little fish. And uh, the point of it is that the standard deviation and the autocorrelation measured in the phytoplankton. So the phytoplankton are the little green guys floating in the water. You can actually measure changes in their autocorrelation and their standard deviation in the model at least, uh, as uh, you get this transition from big fish to little fish or from little fish to big fish. And that's important because measuring fish populations is really, really hard work. You would think it would be fun because it's fishing, but you have to catch zillions and zillions and zillions of fish, and it gets tedious after a while, and the statistics are not very good. We can just get robots and put them on buoys and stick them in the lake, and they measure the phytoplankton every five minutes, and we don't really have to do anything except go download the data every once in a while. So it's, it's really great that the uh, phytoplankton can be the sentinel for us. Um, we did uh, the experiment in this set of experimental lakes. I'm going to talk mainly about Peter and Paul. Paul is uh, a reference lake or control. We call it a reference lake because it's like a reference electrode in electrochemistry, if you ever took electrochemistry. Um, for our purposes, you can remember Paul is small and rhymes with control, sort of. <laughs> and Peter is the manipulated lake, and Peter started out with a lot of little fish, and we gradually added big fish, just a few at a time. We didn't just chuck a bunch of them in there. We'd get a couple, put them in, see what happened, get a couple, put them in, see what happened, and monitor the behavior of the little fish to see if they're getting scared. 
Um, this summarizes the experimental design in a little more detail. We went from less than 20 adults of largemouth bass in Peter Lake to more than 100. Uh, CPUE is catch per unit effort. That means we were getting 15 little fish per minnow trap per hour. Um, uh, and that dropped to essentially zero. Uh, it, it first dropped because they were terrorized, and then it dropped because the bass ate them all. So they really had a good reason to be scared. The um, zooplankton went from pretty little, 0.4 millimeters to one millimeter, and it's really size of the zooplankton, it's body size more than biomass that uh, uh, determines how much grazing they do. When we started the experiment, the chlorophyll, which is a measure of phytoplankton, was much greater in the manipulated lake than the reference lake. At the end of year four, they were about the same. So the trophic cascade worked in, in this experiment. Um, and the indicators work too. So here I've shown you, uh, this is actually the four years. So A is 2008, B is 2009, C is uh, 2010, D is 2011. And what I've plotted here is the variance of chlorophyll. This is the phytoplankton variance in Paul, the reference lake, and Peter, the manipulated lake. You can see that it began to go up pretty consistently here in the second year, and in the third year it was just screamingly high. So we had an early warning of the regime shift by, by day 220 of uh, the third year, essentially the minnows were either gone or completely terrorized, clear up in the bog mat. Uh, the zooplankton had switched and the phytoplankton had switched. So the regime shift was over by day 220 of the third year, but we were getting these warnings uh, more than a year in advance. So if we had only been measuring variance, and by the way, autocorrelation had essentially the same pattern, we would have known that uh, the uh, shift was, was coming. And of course, this is an experiment. We were making the shift, so we weren't surprised. Uh, the, the point wasn't that we could make a shift. We knew we could make a shift. The point was, would we see the indicators in the manipulated lake and not in the reference lake? And we did. So that's pretty cool. So it worked. The next thing you might say is, so what? Um, the, uh, I mean, suppose you can measure these indicators. What if you were managing the lake and you changed the way you managed it uh, when you detected the indicators? And would the lake recover? Would it go back the way it was before? Or is it committed to collapse by you t the time you detect the indicators? And maybe the thing is going off the cliff anyway by the time you can discern the change. And in that case, the indicators aren't really very worthwhile. So that was the next question we asked is, uh, uh, could we actually recover a lake uh, once the indicators fired off? So uh, if you could imagine a situation where you're measuring water quality, water quality is doing just fine. You're measuring an indicator, and the indicator is starting to squeal. And that indicator is related to the resilience or the distance to a threshold for collapse, the, the, the depth of the valley. So the valley is getting small, smaller. The indicator is firing off. Water quality looks fine so far. Could you intervene? Could you go in and do something about it and maintain the water quality? or is the ecosystem committed to falling off the cliff? That's what we wanted to find out. We switched to algae blooms for this experiment because they're a lot easier to deal with than, uh, uh, than fish. Uh, uh, with uh, fish you're, uh, in the trophic cascade, you're keeping track of four trophic levels. I already mentioned it's difficult to census fish. And uh, we had discovered that the phytoplankton worked so well, we thought, let's just focus on the phytoplankton. And we knew we could make algae blooms with nutrients. Um, we, we don't even have, we can skip the cows. Unlike Lake Mendota, we don't even need a cow. We can just buy nitrogen and phosphorus and put it, put it in there. This is the research team. Um, my PI collaborators were Mike Pace and John Cole. Again, by then, Jim Hodgson and Jim Kitchell had retired, and there we are. You can see we're a lot better coordinated for this second experiment. We have matching t-shirts, and it really looks like a team, whereas we were pretty slovenly looking the, uh, the, the first time. 
Um, as in the uh, previous case with the trophic cascades, the first thing we did was we ran ecosystem models to find out if this was going to work. In the case of algae blooms, there are a bunch of models, and they all suggest that the early warnings should, uh, should work. So we had a, a lot to choose from. It's really important to do this kind of modeling study. It, uh, in, this, uh, in this case, it took a graduate student about six months to do the modeling study. The experiment took took eight people uh, several years and probably cost a million dollars. So it's definitely worth it to do this in silico before you go to a real lake. Um, as before, we worked with the sensors. We had a little bit more sophisticated system this time. We downloaded the data from the sensors daily, updated the time series, and we also updated uh, the indicator statistics. For this experiment, we needed an alarm. We needed to know when uh, things, when the uh, indicators were uh, so uh, strong that we should reverse the manipulation. And so we uh, used used a method called quickest detection, which was developed during the Cold War to see when missiles are coming in. And it uh, is an extremely sensitive statistical method for uh, detecting a change in, uh, in an indicator. So every day, we calculated variance and autocorrelation of everything that our little robot measured, and we also calculated the quickest detection statistic to see if an alarm went off. And then the computer, if an alarm went off, the computer immediately texted us and sent us emails. So your phone would go off, uh-oh, I got a text, my buoy is calling, and my buoy said, there's something happening, look at the website. And the website is updated every day with all the data. So we had really quick feedback, and even though we had people all over the continent uh, uh, you know, the PIs were on the East Coast. I, w I, was, I was here. Uh, we had some students up there. Everybody on the team got the warning, got the, in got the information at the same time. We could get on Skype or get on the phone and figure out what we're going to do. So first, let me show you the results of an experiment to test the indicators for algae bloom. Again, we're going to use Paul as the reference lake, Peter as the manipulated lake. This is a pretty simple experiment. We're going to very slowly add nutrients, just a little bit a day, because we don't want to go uh, into the bloom too fast. Measure for warnings, check to see if we have warnings, continue adding nutrients, and see if we get a bloom. So this basically tests whether the warnings work at all for the uh, uh, algae bloom case. And it turns out they do. So uh, this is the data for 2014. Paul is in blue. Peter is in red, and um, uh, there's another uh, experimental lake that I'll, I'm not going to talk about due to time tonight in black. Let's focus on the red one. And uh, here are the statistics for standard deviation and autocorrelation. And they start firing off. Uh, the, the, uh, the ball is an alarm, so that's the quickest detection uh, statistic says a missile is coming. But in, in this case, it's not a missile. It's a blue-green algae bloom. And, uh, uh, so we started to get alarms around day 180 uh, or so, which is uh, late June, about now. And uh, you can see that we had a big algae bloom. This is, this is large numbers uh, by about day 200, 220, something like that. So the warnings went off 20 or maybe 40 days before the algae bloom. Uh, and then here I have some Erlenmeyer flasks, the clear waters from Paul, the uh, turbid waters from Peter. So yep, that's an algae bloom. Um, so basically, the indicators worked again for this situation. Now let's see if we can uh, halt the manipulation and get uh, an effect. So in 2015 now, we, uh, uh, this is the same experimental di design diagram you saw a minute ago, but now we're going to change a couple of things. So we, if uh, we're going to halt the manipulation, when we get a warning. So when the warning occurs, we're going to halt and see if we get the harmful algae bloom or not. HAB stands for harmful algae bloom. Sorry for that. And uh, 
So the intervention decision depends on getting alarms in both phycocyanin, which is a pigment of uh, cyanobacteria, it's unique to cyanobacteria, and chlorophyll, which is a generic pigment, the one that I talked about a few, a few minutes ago. So we actually wrote down a priori the conditions for an alarm and programmed that into the computer that was monitoring the data. So we couldn't fudge it ourselves later. It, uh, you know, the computer was telling us what we wrote down uh, uh, months before the experiment uh, occurred. So here's what happened in the first part of 2015 up to about day 180. Again, we're looking at the red line. So that's Peter Lake. And you can see phycocyanin, the, which is the indicator of cyanobacteria, is going up at a pretty good clip. Chlorophyll was too. And the standard deviation, the measure of variability, is going up. And the autocorrelation is pretty high. It went up quickly and stayed pretty high. So we're getting some indicators here, and we're getting some alarms. And we had them in chlorophyll too. So we had basically met the criteria for pulling the plug. And we decided to end the nutrient addition on day 180, which is the 29th of June in that year. The air photo just shows what the lakes are looking like then. And you can see Peter's beginning to green up. This is Peter over here. It's beginning to green up pretty, pretty well. So what happened? You could imagine, you know, we'd already added a bunch of nutrients. These things are growing exponentially. Maybe they just kept going up. On the other hand, you could think, well, we added all the nutrients we were going to add because we stopped on day 180. Maybe they're just going to flatline, and they'll just hang in there because we did add those nutrients, and they'll use them. Or maybe they're going to go down. Maybe they have not crossed a threshold, and the lake is going to recover. How many of you think they went up? OK, one. All right. How many? Oh, two. All right. How many think they flatlined? That's what I thought. OK, a few. How many think they went down? Well, there's a lot of people out there that didn't vote. You know, in Australia, you can be fined for not voting. So, so we're going we're to be taking names. They went down. So uh, we, uh, the green box there is the period of time we were adding nutrients. And literally the day after we stopped adding nutrients, they went down. So what happened here is we got these warnings, most of them around uh, starting at day 160. Um, and actually, the warnings were complete by day 176. On day 180, we pulled the plug on the nutrients. And the water quality improved immediately. So the early warning came soon enough to prevent the transition to the turbid state, the permanently turbid state. So this is pretty encouraging, actually. I mean, maybe, maybe this could really work to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to do something in, in the world. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to tell you about another really cool development that's very, very recent. Um, I've been talking about variability in time, but what about variability in space? It would be really useful if variability in space could give us an early warning of a change, of a big change in an ecosystem. The reason is that it's very, very laborious to measure everything every day all the time. It takes a big crew. It takes a lot of gadgets. And the gadgets have to be completely reliable. They've got to function every five minutes for hundreds of days at a time. And that's a difficult thing to do in the real world. But if you could do it with space, maybe you could measure the spatial pattern just every once in a while maybe every couple of weeks or something like that, which would be much less work. That just means you have to make your machine work once every two weeks. And you have the other 13 days to practice with it to, you know, to hope that it works. Or maybe you can even measure it from a satellite or from an aircraft. 
Um, I, think that, I think that would be really, really great, although we didn't do that in this experiment. Turns out that Emily Stanley, who's another professor in uh, the Center for Limnology, and her team have devised a gadget that can map the pigments in a lake in about an hour. And so you, here you see Anders Upgaard, who did a, uh, uh, an undergrad thesis on this, driving a boat around. And Anders can just do this squiggly path in the lake and get a pretty good map of pigments in the lake. And we can calculate all sorts of variability statistics from uh, those maps. And uh, Vince Butita, who's a master's student with Emily, is the guy who did these uh, calculations. So it's potentially a really neat tool. Once again, we have models that tell us how the pattern should change. Um, what, uh, uh, what this diagram shows is a results of a model at uh, increasing nutrients. So top left is low nutrients, then they go up a little top middle, up a little more top right, a little more bottom left. This is just like reading in, in a Western language. Um, uh, a, a little more uh, bottom center and, and, and the most bottom right. And so it starts out with pretty much no variability in space and actually not much autocorrelation. Then it begins to develop more and more variability and, and also more autocorrelation until actually the variability and the correlation start to disappear. And over here in the green state, there's really low variability and autocorrelation. So actually, the variability and autocorrelation in space in this model change much the way they did in time. But in this case, we only sampled it six times. Instead, in over in, in the model, only six times over a very long period instead of every five minutes. But we had to do it in space. So what happens when we do it in the real lake? So now Anders goes out, he drives the boats around, makes the squiggly lines. The uh, Vince takes the data, runs them through a bunch of statistics. So uh, what you're seeing here in this panel, the Peter Phycocyanin is the pink uh, polygon. The Paul phycocyanin is a, bl a pale blue polygon that you can barely see, so Paul had hardly any in it. And you can see this bloom that you saw a couple of minutes ago uh, at uh, uh, just before day 180. These are actually the spatial data, not the middle of the lake data, so they're slightly displaced. The red is the standard deviation, a measure of variability now in space. Um, uh, and, and the blue is the standard deviation in Paul Lake. So you can see that the standard deviation went up and got pretty high um, and then came down after we turned off the, the nutrients. So we could have used the variability in space as the early warning indicator for this experiment. It, we didn't do it with space, but we could have if we'd known. We could have done it in space. and. Um, I've got some other statistics here, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip over them. But um, we can go back to them later if somebody's fascinated by them. Because I think I should wrap up. So I've, I've told you a lot uh, today, and I've bounced around uh, from uh, rangelands to coral reefs to lakes. I could have talked about oceans, but I, but I didn't. Uh, and I could have talked about forests, but I didn't either. So, uh, uh, but the same phenomena are known from them. So big changes can occur, and they can occur reasonably quickly uh, by human standards, fairly quickly on a human time scale in resources that we might care a lot about. So we might need that lake for drinking water, for fishing, for recreation. Coral reefs are uh, the basis of huge recreational industries in the countries where they occur. And many of those are poor countries where that recreational industry is a key part of the economy. Um, rangelands uh, are obviously important economically for food production, forests for uh, wood and fiber production, and so on. And these things can undergo really big changes. They're rare. The big changes are very rare. Uh, but when they happen, they're important. and they're hard to predict in advance. 
Um, I went through uh, a theory that explains that ecosystems become more variable and autocorrelated as stress builds before a big change. And um, even though uh, the underlying math may seem a little complicated, the rule of thumb is pretty easy. The variability and autocorrelation go up. That means the resilience is getting low, and that means a big change is going to happen. Um, and by the way, that theory has been tested in systems uh, other than ecosystems. So for example, there are studies using it to uh, predict depressive episodes in patients where the patient is pinged with a, uh, a, a question at random times, about five times a day. Simple question, they answer the question, and statistics based on the variability of their answers are used to predict whether they are losing their resilience to a depressive episode. And in the papers that I've seen, it appears to work. I'm not a psychologist, so I, I can't comment uh, further. There are also physiological cases with um, heart attacks and with uh, seizures, with uh, uh, epileptic uh, seizures. So um, um, th this seems to be a, a, a hallmark of complex systems, not merely ecosystems or, or lakes. I showed you experiments that support the theory. I showed you some lab experiments from other people's work. And uh, I showed you uh, the whole lake experiments that my group has done. I pointed out that maps might make this a lot easier. And so Emily Stanley's work, mapping the patterns of the pigments so we can calculate the variability from the spatial patterns of the pigments, I think is really uh, an important frontier here. And I'm looking forward to um, working on that more. Um, grant proposals are in the mill. Um, the experiments that I showed you occurred in near ideal field conditions, right? We know these lakes very well. We have big teams, ton of equipment. We're measuring everything, much of it at five minute intervals, the rest of it uh, almost every day. And we have a reference lake. We have a control to protect us from certain kinds of spurious uh, uh, results. In the real world, you may not have any of those things. So, so that's a caution uh, about the potential application of these uh, methods. We don't know if they're going to work in the real world because even though we had real lakes, the real world is much messier than our experimental lake situation. For example, we completely control the watersheds and we control the fishing, which you don't in the real world. Um, so actually, the smarter thing to do would be to build resilience of things you like. Right? Try to make the valleys that the things you want uh, as deep as you can. Deepen the valleys for ecosystems that you want um, or for your own health, uh, for, for example. And building resilience means you don't have to worry about the resilience indicators so much um, because even though they work, what they tell you is you've lost a lot of resilience. And it would be better to just not lose the resilience in the first place. So with that, I will stop. I don't know if you all take questions. I'd be glad to take them if that's your custom.